you have your Bibles, why don't you just go ahead and pull them out? I was going to say turn them on, but I've made that joke so many times. I'm hoping you'll start bringing a paper Bible. I just love the nostalgia of hearing the pages just flipping open. We're an analog church. Come on, somebody. Matthew chapter 4. Everybody's like, say the verse. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And uh, I'm really, really excited because we're in part four of the Holy Habit series. And um, I just have just thoroughly enjoyed uh, diving into God's word together. Today is going to be a really good one in Matthew chapter four. But before we jump in and and read the text, um, have you ever heard the statement, you've changed, bro? Have you ever heard that, that statement like in a movie or, or maybe someone's told you that before? You've changed, bro. Like typically it's not good when someone says that to you. Uh, I was hanging out with a friend recently who I hadn't seen since college. And uh, he was like, man, what have you been up to? Like, like what, what's life look like now? And I was like, man, I'm married. He's like, what? I mean, he was shocked that I got married. <laughs> I was like, what are you trying to say, dude? I was like, yeah, I got two kids. He was like, what? I was like, I'm a pastor. He was like, no, you're lying. Like, he was so, sh- he was like, you changed, bro. Like, that's, that's what he said. You've changed, bro. Um, I, I think uh, that statement is, is something that typically is, is something that's a negative. Uh, I realized that I changed a lot when I became a girl dad. I've, I've said this before, but um, we were in the hospital I'm holding Mila for the first time. I'm sitting in that uncomfortable dad bed recliner thing, and I'm sitting there, and I just, something came over me. I was on Facebook Marketplace looking up where to buy a Rottweiler uh, (laughs) because I changed. We got out of the hospital, and we went to Chili's because that's what you do um, when you get out of the hospital. We went to Chili's, and we're sitting in Chili's, and there was a a little three- or four-year-old boy who kept looking at Mila. I started flexing at him. I was like going like this, and Maddie was like, you're going to go to prison. Like, <laughs> you've changed, Noah. Like, you've changed. Um, I think that where you can really see that you've changed, though, is in, a, is in photos. And so I was looking for a photo to illustrate this, and I found a photo that illustrates it even more. Look at this photo right here of me and Grant Skeldon. Okay, uh, this is uh, Grant. Uh, you guys know Grant. He teaches here pretty regularly. This was January of 2017. That's when this photo was taken. It's the day after I met Grant Skeldon. Yes, it's staged because who cuts down trees in a champion sweatsuit with one glove on or, uh, or ripped skinny jeans? Um, I, fun fact, I was invited on this little excursion to take photos. Uh, Grant shared this before. Uh, he hired me to be the photographer for this little trip. And the photographer is in all of the, f- the photos. So I was fired. Uh, literally, Grant fired me. Anyways, uh, I found this photo and I was like, you've changed, bro. Like, like, I look different. Grant looks different. And the thing that I love about change is we always think and assume that we're changing for the better, right? Like right now, you're like, I am way better than I used to be. Like that's what we're all kind of subconsciously thinking. Like I'm growing, I'm getting better. And then what happens is you see a photo of the season that you thought you were changing for the better and you're like, what in the world was I doing? Okay, someone told me today, I, I, I really like this uh, shirt, and someone told me today they really liked it. They said that it looks like an elevated bath towel, and um, I just appreciate that so much. And so five years from now, I'm going to look back on this photo, and I'm going to be like, babe, why did you let me wear an elevated bath towel to Way Church? I've changed. I've changed. Um, whether you realize it or not, you're changing. Right? We're all changing. We're changing physically, we're changing emotionally, we're changing mentally, and we're definitely changing spiritually. Uh, in fact, theologians and Bible scholars, they have a word for changing spiritually, and it's this word called formation. Formation. You're being formed in the image of Jesus. That's what it looks like to change spiritually as a Jesus follower. One of my favorite quotes on changing spiritually comes from a man named Dallas Willard, who you guys hear me quote almost every week. If you've never read his books, you should do it. He says this, as Christians, spiritual formation is the process of transformation of the innermost part of the human heart. 
It is being formed or transformed in such a way that its natural expression comes to be the works of Christ done in the power of Christ. So spiritually changing to become more like Jesus looks like your heart being transformed, and it leads to you doing the works of Jesus in the power of Jesus, right? So, so the works are not the point. The works are the byproduct. We spent the, the whole series of James talking about how faith without works is dead, but it has to start with transformation first because if you do it the other way, you're going to burn out. You're not going to fall more in love with Jesus. You're probably not going to uh, keep coming to church. Um, don't want to rehash all that, but it's got to start with an inner change, and it's going to lead to work change. It's going to lead to you living with the power of God. I cannot think of something our world needs more than Christians being transformed and living and doing the works of Jesus in the power of Jesus. Can't think of something our, our world needs more. So that's the whole point of this series that we're in, Holy Habits, because we are desiring to intentionally change to become more like Jesus. And we started this series by saying, if we want to change what we do, we've got to change who we're with. If we want to change our works, we've got to be transformed. And the only way to be truly transformed is for Jesus Christ to transform you from the inside out. And so we gave this little formula. Uh, we know that God's not a formula. Uh, I'm not saying that, that this works exactly perfect, but just in general, this does work spiritually. We spent all of week one breaking this down. But you have a holy habit plus a holy God plus time equals spiritual change. Okay, that's our formula. A holy habit plus a holy God plus time leads to spiritual change. Uh, the power is not in the habit. The power is in the God. But the habit gets us in the presence of the holy God so that he can change us. And over time, we look back and we go, man, I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. The stuff I used to struggle with, I'm not struggling with as much anymore. The, the things I used to say, I'm not saying anymore. That time piece is really, really critical. We said uh, uh, the difference between a black belt and a white belt is that a white belt just kept showing up. Right? The difference between uh, an ordinary person and a saint is a saint just kept following Jesus. Right? Galatians chapter 6, don't grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. That scripture is not about bicep curls, it's not about investing, it's about becoming more like Jesus. So the timepiece is crucial. Um, one of the things that makes this difficult, though, is that while we're trying to become like Jesus, the world is trying to get us to become like it. So there's two things that are forming us at the same time. There's the spirit of Jesus, there's Jesus Christ, there's God the Father, and then there's the devil in the world that's trying to change us as well. And we see this in really small things and we see this in really big things. Uh, this past week, I was preaching in Canada. I was there for four days. And by the fourth day, I was calling Coke pop. I was like, you know what sounds like it would be really good right now? Some pop. A. Eh? I was just saying that. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? I, I was being formed into a Canadian. There's actually studies that have been done on how the city you, lives in, you live in subconsciously forms you. Um, it's been scientifically proven that if you live in New York City, you walk faster than people who live in Nashville, Tennessee. Did you know that? Like, like you're, you're just average speed of walking in New York City is a lot faster. So if you're competing in a speed walking competition, move, move to New York City for some training, okay? Nashville's going to frustrate you. Uh, our cities, they form us. They, they form us subconsciously. Our, our friends form us. The people we follow on social media, they form us. Podcasts form us. Movies form us. Every part of our life, every area of our life is forming us. So the question is not, are we changing today? The question is, are we changing to look more like Jesus? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we truly changing to, to look more like Jesus? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who uh, was an amazing, amazing pastor and theologian in Nazi Germany, he once climbed to the top of a hill with some of his disciples and students. And at the top of this hill, it overlooked a concentration camp. 
And he climbed to the top of the hill and he was overwhelmed with emotion. Just began to, to weep at the top of this hill. And he turned and he looked at his students and he said, what Christ is forming here has to be stronger than what the world is forming there. Is what Christ is forming in your heart here stronger than what the world is forming everywhere else in your life? That's what we want to look at today. Romans 12.2 says, For do not be conformed by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we're going to attempt to do today by looking at the habit of scripture. Everybody say scripture. Scripture. A couple quick things about scripture. I wish that this one was a three-part sermon. It's only a one-part sermon. I don't have time to break down all of these baselines, but just a few things that I'm operating under today as baselines for this talk. Number one, I, I believe with all my heart that the Bible is the written word of God. So if you don't hear God, I think you should read God. Um, I, I believe with all my heart that the Bible doesn't need an update. It's not like an iPhone. We, we don't need to update it. It was just an iOS one time, and it's there forever. No updates to the Bible. It's unchanging. I believe that every word of the Bible is truth. I believe that every word of the Bible was divinely inspired by God, that he inspired every word in it, that he wrote this book through his vessels, and that this book has become the most sold book of all time for a reason, because it's God speaking to us. This book wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And so every word can be applied and can be used as we follow Jesus. And so that's some, some stuff that I'm operating as a baseline for. If you have questions about that, we would love to talk to you, um, but everything I'm about to say, uh, I'm saying it because I believe those things. And we're going to look at uh, this story in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is going to use this word to overcome the lies that the devil is trying to form Jesus through. Is that cool? Amazing. I was going to do it anyways. Matthew 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights, he was hungry. All right, quick stop here. I used to read this, and I've even heard it preached, that the devil came to Jesus because he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was weak. That is false. Uh, Jesus was not weak after fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. He was strong after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. We got to get that right. You're not weaker by fasting and praying. You're stronger by fasting and praying. Okay, so I just want to stop and say that. Uh, that's another sermon. We'll get to that later in the series. Verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Everybody say bread. bread. Jesus answered, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so um, pausing right here, what is the devil doing? What's the point of this? The devil comes to Jesus. He says, you see those stones? Turn them into bread. Uh, I, I read this maybe the first few times that I had read scripture, and I was like, I don't understand what the big deal is. If Jesus is God, just turn it into bread, you know? Um, but the thing beneath the thing that's happening here is the devil is trying to get Jesus to stop trusting his heavenly father for provision and start doing it on his own. Now, Jesus was God. He could have turned the stones into bread if he wanted to, but it wasn't time for Jesus to start doing that yet. God hadn't told him to do that yet. And so what the devil was trying to do in this moment is to get Jesus to do things his own way. Now, on the surface, it looks very, is that big of a deal, turning stones into bread. But I just want to point out that this is exactly what the devil does in our life. He tries to form us by asking the question, is it really that big of a deal? Is it really that big of a deal for you to watch that three-hour movie that goes against everything Jesus was for? Is it really that big of a deal if you cheat a little on your taxes? Is it really that big of a deal if you don't use your money the way God asked you to use your money? Is it really that big of a deal if I get drunk with the boys tonight? Is it really that big of a deal if I vent about my spouse at girls' night? Is it really that big of a deal? What we got to understand is big deal actions always start from an is it that big of a deal question. The question we should be asking is not is it that big of a deal. 
The question we should be asking is, is this making me more like Jesus? Because my decisions are leading me somewhere. And a decision eventually leads to a habit. And just like there are holy habits, there are also fleshly habits. And they don't just start by themselves. They start with, is it that big of a deal? I think God is looking for some Christians who go, I'm not trying to find the gray area to live in. I'm trying to find Jesus' will for my life, and I'm trying to live there. Okay, so just wanted to stop and and clarify that for a second, because now the devil turns, he says, turn these stones into bread, and Jesus is going to say, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He responds to the devil's lies with the truth of scripture. He says, it is written. Here's the thing about Jesus's strategy. It is hard to say it is written if you don't know what is written. So my first observation from this text is that you need to know the word of God before you need the word of God. Because if you wait till you need it and you don't know it, you are going to believe whatever lie the devil throws at you. You're just going to believe it. And and so your whole strategy of following Jesus, if you're not reading scripture, is just, I hope I get there. I hope I live in God's will for my life. And I'm just telling you, hope is a great thing to put in Jesus, but it's a really bad thing to put in yourself. And if you are living life without the word of God, you are putting all of your hope of ending up where Jesus wants you to end up in yourself. It's a bad place to be. When I hear about people who get up in the morning to study scripture, when I hear about people who stay up late at night reading their Bible, I don't think, oh man, what a cute little habit. I'm not thinking, oh, what a great way to spend their time. I'm thinking, man, that person's getting ready for a spiritual battle. I'm thinking, man, that person's not just getting ready for a spiritual battle, they're going to win a spiritual battle by spending time in God's word. Because when the devil comes to them and says, hey, your past has too many mistakes to follow Jesus, that person's going to go, Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When the devil says that God doesn't see you, they can say Genesis 16, 13, for you are the God who sees me. When the devil says that God is far away and you're hurt, they can say Psalms 34, 17. No, he is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. When the devil says you should be afraid, they can say Psalms 27, 1. Man, the Lord is my shepherd. Whom shall I fear? When the devil says that the storm is too great, they can say Hebrews 6, 19, I have a hope as an anchor for my soul. When the devil says this world is too dark, it's too confusing to follow Jesus, that person can wake up and say Psalms 119, 105, the word is a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. He reveals the next step. I've got the truth of God's word to fight every lie of the enemy. I'm not just reading to read. I'm reading so that the God of the universe can fight my battles for me. Don't show up to a fight without a weapon. If you don't read the word of God, I'm telling you, you are showing up to a battle with no weapon. And you're going to lose that fight. Somehow the, the devil has told an entire generation, you can follow Jesus without this book. It's a lie. It's a lie. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to get to that in a second. Verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Then Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. All right. Did you notice what happened? First lie that the devil tells, Jesus says, it is written and quotes scripture. Second lie, it's the devil who is saying it is written. Did you catch that? So, so now we've got the devil using scripture, only the devil's not using it in its proper context. He's taking it out of context. You can get the Bible to say whatever you want if you take it out of context. Yeah. I mean, you could, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I could use the Bible right now to tell you that Moses loved playing pickleball. Because in the book of Genesis, it says that Moses refused to serve in the court of Pharaoh. Okay, that was, that was bad. I'm going to take that out, second service. <laughs> Here's the big idea from verse 5 through 7. The devil knows scripture. Does he know it better than you? 
Because if the devil knows scripture better than you, you'll hear scripture verses and not know what they were meant to say. And you might use scripture to follow the devil and not Jesus. You've got to know the word of God by yourself. I'm not asking if you, if you know sermons or podcasts or YouTube channels about scripture. I'm asking, do you know scripture? An older saint in my life one time, I've shared this before, but it's just so powerful. She said to me, she said, there's coming a day when people are going to set aside the Bible in order to try to become more like Jesus. That's what she said. What she was implying there is that there were going to be people who had this, this idea of Jesus that was contrary to the Bible, and they were going to set aside the Bible so that they could be more like Jesus. Guys, that's not Jesus. That is a figment of our imagination. You can't follow Jesus without this book. Our idea of Jesus comes from this book. Our image of Jesus comes from this book. This is where we know what Jesus said. This is where we learn what Jesus did. This is where we learn Jesus' heart. If we're not using this book, we're going to follow somebody that is not Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to step on your toes for the next eight minutes. Um, my grandpa, grandfather, every time he was going to do this, he'd say, everybody loves pastor, raise your hand. So everybody loves pastor, raise your hand. And then boom. All right. Um, here are a few things we have to remove from our vocabulary as Christians when it comes to God's word. Number one, the phrase, I don't have time to read the Bible. Uh, if you don't have time to read the Bible, I totally agree with you. As long as you're somebody who works 16 hour days, you have multiple kids you have a spouse, you threw away your smartphone because you don't have time for it. Um, you threw away all your sports jerseys because you don't have time for it. Uh, you got rid of all hobbies because you don't have time for it. If, if that is you, then just excuse yourself from this conversation. But seeing as that's not you, um, it's not that we don't have time. It's that we don't have the right priority. Yeah. This is what Richard Foster said. He said, the problem is not finding the time. The problem is convincing myself that this is important enough to set aside the time. This is my promise. If you commit to spending time in God's word, your I don't have time statement is going to be changed to I don't have time not to. Because not only are you going to see yourself overcoming battles that you used to lose, but you're also going to start falling more in love with the author than you've ever fallen in love with him. It's going to go from something you feel like you have to do to something you feel like you get to do. You're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to crave the word of God more than you crave the coffee. I, it, it goes from duty to delight. It, it goes from, from being this thing that you're like, ah, oh, I just have to go read this. And all of a sudden, the Bible starts to read you. It starts to encourage you. It starts to speak to you. It starts to apply to your everyday life. And all of a sudden, you're like, man, this book, I need it. I've got to have it. I'm craving it. Number two, we got to remove this phrase. I don't need to read the Bible to follow Jesus. Again, this is a lie that the devil has told our generation. Um, I preached at a college about a year ago, and uh, I was talking to a guy afterwards, and he was asking me how to follow Jesus. And I said, well, I'd start with the Bible. I said, I'd start there. I'd, I'd read the Bible every morning. And he said, well, I don't think that you have to read the Bible to follow Jesus. And I said, well, why do you think that? Where do you get that from? And, and he was being really uh, respectful. It wasn't like a weird or mean conversation. Um, I've had a few of those too. Uh, but this guy was just being really nice and curious. And, and he said, well, I remember one time hearing about the story of the thief on the cross. And I was like, okay, what do you remember about it? And he said, well, I remember the thief was on the cross and he asked Jesus in his last moments, could, could I go with you where you're going? Uh, you know, if you're really God, take me with you. And Jesus said, surely as, as I, I speak to you, you will be with me in paradise today. You guys remember that story? And so he said, well, that guy got to go to heaven and he never read one verse of scripture. And I just looked at him and I said, are you planning on dying today? And he's like, no. Why do you ask that? And I said, well, that guy put his faith in Jesus and he died. He didn't have time to read scripture. He didn't have anywhere to have to follow Jesus after that moment. So is scripture reading required for salvation? No, it's not. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. Is scripture required to follow Jesus? Yes. How can you follow a man that you don't know what he says? You don't know what he did? You can't. So if you're planning on sticking around, you should read this book. That's what I said to him. And he, he had this moment, you know, he was trying to figure it out. I was like, have you ever read the, the story of the thief on the cross? And he was like, no. He started laughing. I was like, you should start there. 
We have to use this book if we're going to follow Jesus. I love this quote from James Merritt. He says, the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but to know God. I'm reading this book to know God. Why would you not want to do that? If you've truly been saved, if you've truly given your life to Jesus, if you truly understand what Jesus did for you, why would you not want to get to know the author of this book? Right? It's, not, it's not about checking a box off. It's going, man, I want to know the God that died for me. I want to know the God that wants to speak to me. I, w- I want to know him. Number three, um, this is more of a pastor pet peeve, but I, I do think we have to get rid of it as Christians. It's, I'm not being fed. I'm not being fed. As a pastor, I kind of like get twitches when I hear people say that. I'm not being fed. Um, my mom's here, and something that my mom used to do when I was in college is uh, my parents would come and visit me in school, and you know they might spend like a day or two with me. And before they would leave, my mom would always go, we're going to go to Publix, and we're going to get you groceries before we go back home. And I mean, as a college kid, come on, that's like, that's Christmas came early. You know, I'm like, don't forget the cinnamon toast, large box, you know, cinnamon toast crunch. So imagine my mom and dad, they came and they, they did one of these, you know, grocery runs. And then they brought it to my apartment or my dorm room and they stocked the fridge and they stocked the pantry and they stocked the freezer because uh, they always would. I mean, it was just, it was enough food for like a month. Imagine they did all that. And then three days later, they call me and they're like, hey, what are you up to? Like, oh, I'm sitting here. I'm I'm watching the Nashville Predators get bounced in the first round again. Sorry, I need prayer. I'm still upset. (laughs) I'm I'm watching sports. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm just hungry. You're like, what? You're hungry? Yeah, I'm just not being fed. She's not being fed today. My mom would come through that telephone. She would slap me upside the head. She'd be like, you are letting that deli meat go bad that I put in your fridge? You know, but, but this is what we do sometimes. We go to church. We go to small group. And over time, we go, oh, I'm just not being fed. And we go to another place. Because what we've decided to do is act like spiritual babies who haven't been given a fridge full of food that we can wake up and eat from each and every day. Listen, this is what the church's job is not. The church's job is not you and Jesus' relationship to build that. No, the church's job is to equip you to follow Jesus to the best of your ability. The church's job is to encourage you that there are other people in the city who are doing life together following Jesus. It is your responsibility to eat. I pray each and every sermon that you get a snack. I, I pray each and every week, hopefully you get more than a snack. Like I'm praying that I'm, I'm, I'm dishing out some, some steak dinners, okay? But if you don't eat till next Sunday, you're going to come in here spiritually malnourished. You're, you're going to come in here, your, your stomach's going to be growling. And you're going to be tempted to believe the lie, I'm not being fed and it's someone else's problem. No, it is our problem if we're not eating. We don't live in a country where the Bible is illegal. We don't live in a country where we're dragged out for having church. We live in a place, thank you, Lord, that we can stand here and we can worship God freely. We can read from this book freely. Nobody is stopping us from eating. You got to eat. That's the whole point of this sermon. The holy habit of reading God's word so that it can get inside of us. The more you read God's word, the more you get in God's word, the more God's word gets in you. So I want to end really practical because I really wish that when I was following, um, when I first started following Jesus, someone would have done this with me. Uh, I have a few slides that I want to show you of how I study scripture. And um, we're going to post these slides on Instagram right after service today so that you can screenshot them because I realize the angles are bad. That's why I moved. Um, Okay, so uh, I would just, hey, if you're not reading your Bible right now, there's no shame in that. You should start today. You should start when we leave church. So I would start 15 minutes. That's it. Just just start with 15 minutes. Um, Read to understand it, not to get through it. So It's not, I'm going to read five chapters every single day. It's, I'm going to read to understand it. So if my 15 minutes takes me, you know, through four verses, that's great. As long as you leave those four verses understanding what God was saying. 
in, in, in those verses, okay? Um, and then these are some questions that I'm asking when I'm reading scripture, because you should always be asking questions, okay? Uh, not every piece of scripture do we just pluck out uh, by itself and go, yeah, that's what got, like, we need the context. And so I'm asking, what's the context? Who was it written to? Who was it written by? Is there something about God or Jesus for me to learn? Is there a sin that I need to confess? Is there a promise for me to hold on to? Is there an example or principle for me to follow? How does this point to or what does this have to do with Jesus? Okay, and I'm going to give you some resources that will help you with those questions as well on the next slide. All right, ready? Um, This is where I would start. I would start in John. Uh, I'm going back and forth because I'm trying not to block. I feel like an Apple presenter. I'm like, (laughs) iOS 1, remember. Um, John Proverbs, Psalms, Genesis, James. These are, this is just me talking here. I just think John is a great place to start. You get the full gospel there. You get, get to fall more in love with Jesus. Proverbs, I read a Proverbs every single day. There's 31 Proverbs, uh, 31 chapters um, in the book of Proverbs. And so I just read whatever Proverbs it is uh, on, the, on the monthly calendar. So today's May 5th. I, I read Proverbs 5 this morning. Um, Psalms, amazing. Genesis, you know, very beginning. That's at the very front of the Bible. And then James is just very practical. And so these are just great books to start. Uh, and then this is, this is where we get a little nerdy, but I really, really would recommend this. Um, these are commentaries. If you're not familiar with uh, what a commentary is, it's simply people who are way smarter than me, uh, PhDs in biblical study that have gone through the Word of God and they give their comments on different passages of Scripture. It's very, very helpful as you're reading Scripture to make sure that you're reading a commentary so that you can understand what you're reading. There's lots of times I'm reading and I'm like, I don't really know what's happening here. A commentary helps so much. These are a few of my favorites right here um, that, I, that I would recommend. And then two podcasts that I'm always listening to uh, are the Bible Project and the Bible Recap. They're just great podcasts. You can listen to them in your car uh, to help do a deep dive on scripture. Um, Bonus. So this is a habit that I talk about in in the book, Holy Habits, that really changed my life. Um, I bought this little leather notebook and I noticed that I kept falling prey to the same temptations, uh, the same lies of the enemy. And I also noticed that I didn't know any scripture that went against those temptations and those lies. And so I wrote, I got this little notebook and I remember I wrote initially like five lies that I kept believing either about myself or about life. And I wrote those five lies down and then I went and I found scripture that spoke truth to those lies. And I wrote the scripture underneath the notebook. And I did that because Anytime I would think the lie or be tempted in that way, I would pull out the notebook and I would read the truth over myself. That sounds so cheesy. It felt cheesy the first couple of times. I'm like sitting in my car at 7-Eleven reading from a little chicken scratch handwrite notebook, truth over myself. But what happened was over time, I started to memorize the truth to where I would hear the lie and then immediately the next thought that would pop into my mind was the truth. You wanna talk about overcoming temptation in your life that you used to fall prey to, you get to that point. And so now this notebook, it's got like 60 something lies that I have, I have either uh, fell prey to or, or uh, you know, are constantly tempted by, and I just fill it with God's truth. And I, I can just quote the scripture that overcomes the lie and it really, really, really has helped me. I know it's helped Grant and some other people in this room as well. Um, would highly recommend it. That was the bonus tip. You get extra credit if you do that. Um, and so, just really hope that this is, is practically helpful. It's a little bit of a different way to, to end um, our service. But man, when we were praying about Way Church, there were a few things that we immediately prayed for. We prayed, we wanna be a church that reaches lost people in our city. We said, we wanna be a church that reaches families in our city because a church that doesn't care about the future of the church is a church that doesn't have a future. And so we wanna reach kids and students. Like, like that's our heart. But right after that, we started talking about how we want to be a church that teaches people to fall in love with God's word. The numbers are pretty staggering at the decline in Christians who read the Bible. We want our church to be the opposite of those numbers. We want the norm to be that we spend time in scripture every day, not 
the rare. Not because there's some report card being done on Way Church, but because a church that reads scripture is a church that lives scripture. And a church that lives scripture is exactly what our world needs. A church that has been transformed in the innermost part of their heart. A church that is living and doing the works of Christ in the power of Christ. Come on, if you're believing that for Nashville, Tennessee, can we praise God?